Wallach on Law examines criminal cases and criminal justice and asks the question, we are tough on crime, but is that helping? Can we be smarter and make us safer? You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Ian Wallach is a criminal defense attorney and civil rights lawyer in Los Angeles and New York. Whose cases have ranged from defense of the accused to prosecution of governments in their treatment of convicts. He's a former Los Angeles deputy public defender and a frequent contributor on legal issues to radio and television shows nationwide. You're out of order! You're out of order! The whole trial is out of order! You're gonna need a bigger post. This country, our courts are the great levelers. In our courts, all men are created equal. This is Wallach on Law. Here's your host, Ian Wallach. Hello, everybody, and thank you, thank you, welcome, and thank you for joining us for the pilot episode of Wallach on Law, a show that asks the question, is being tough on crime really getting us anywhere? Are we any better for it in the long run? Let's begin the story talking about the show talking about some of the top stories in the world of criminal justice. According to a Department of Justice report that was issued on Friday, the department is called the Jails of Los Angeles Deplorable. It stated that conditions have led to a dramatic increase in suicides, with 15 occurring um, in less than the, the past 30 months. That's up from four in 2012. The Supreme Court has struck down Florida's practice of justifying one's capacity to be executed or to see if they qualify for execution based on a single IQ test alone. Uh, to discuss that case, we're going to be speaking with Pete Mills. He's an attorney who is involved with the case. We're going to find out what this, this decision means and, and, and what changes we can expect to see. Also, the public's become aware of a Department of Justice policy memo mandating that all suspect interviews are going to be recorded. And we're going to speak with a great attorney, Chad Curlett, uh, from Maryland, D.C. and New York, on what this policy memo means and, and what, it, what it does not mean. Let's talk about some of the top criminal cases that are pending right now. Uh, two 12-year-old girls are charged with attempted murder after stabbing a fellow middle school classmate uh, 19 times. It's a terribly heinous crime. Uh, the victim was in fair condition in the hospital, but thankfully she was released on Saturday. One of the wounds came within millimeters of a major heart uh, artery. She's incredibly lucky. Uh, well, I'm lucky as far as as far as outcome, but this is, this is absolutely a travesty. Two, the two suspects were apparently obsessed with this internet character, uh, Slenderman, and they wanted to prove themselves worthy of this fictional internet character. They believed that he lived in a mansion nearby the house and uh, nearby the park where the incident took place. And they wanted to kill the victim, walk to the home of this slender man or what they believed was his home, and, and present themselves uh, to him. Per reports, the children face uh, up to 65 years of incarceration for this. Under Wisconsin law, any homicide by anyone over 10 years old is automatically filed in adult court. This is uh, the result of a law that was enacted in 1996 in response to a rise in gang violence. But it seems to be at odds with the underpinnings of the juvenile justice system. Uh, justice Kagan in Miller v. Alabama was discussing why mandatory life without parole uh, for juveniles uh, constituted uh, an Eighth Amendment violation, why it was cruel and unusual punishment. And what she did, she talked about what she referred to as the hallmark features of the juvenile mind, and she said that these include immaturity, impetuosity, and the failure to appreciate risks and consequences. Well, there's no question uh, that the juveniles can engage in absolutely uh, horrific conduct. This is extreme, but juveniles can certainly engage in horrific conduct. And the juvenile justice system is designed to address the young mind and to address such conduct. And, and, and it, juveniles can be kept in custody until the age of 25 or even definitely if they're uh, put in a mental, health, in a mental hospital. And, and we're going to see if that happens here or if the state of Wisconsin is moving forward with the idea that there are, that there are some children who are simply beyond redemption and should grow up and live in prison. Uh, Aaron Hernandez has two new trials, now has three trials. The New England Patriots player is already facing trial of the death of Odin Lloyd. This was an acquaintance of Mr. Hernandez, and it appears that there is overwhelming evidence in this matter. Uh, Mr. Lloyd was killed within a mile of Mr. Hernandez's home. Uh, the, the vehicle that was used for the, for the killing was recovered, apparently, in Mr. Hernandez's home. Uh, the two had been in contact during the day. There's apparently video. Um, so it seems to be overwhelming evidence in that matter. Uh, on May 15th, he was indicted on more counts in relation to two other killings, and he's also been indicted on a third matter in relation to allegations of a jailhouse assault that took place while he's been in custody over the past year. Of course, that last is the smallest of his, of his concerns. Um, investigators are presently seeking information from his tattoo artists. There may be tattoos that Mr. Hernandez got that actually relate to the offenses. Now, sometimes criminals can, can get tattoos to represent certain crimes that they've committed. Typically, these are 
teardrops for murders or spider webs for prison time, or the, the penal code that they were either you know, did or were convicted of tattooed on their arm, the, the number of the code. This, this, and these can be used as, as admissions that the individual undertook or did, did the crime that they're accused of doing. This was the case with gang member Anthony Garcia. As he was convicted of a murder after an investigator discovered that, that Mr. Garcia had the scene of an unsolved murder inked to his chest. Now, Joe Capabianco, this is a, a Connecticut tattoo artist. He's a jug, judge on the show, Best Ink. Uh, gave a statement and said there's an unwritten code and that one does not want a uh, rat on one's clients. Uh, just for the record, that's ridiculous. There is an attorney-client privilege. If you, if you, you can speak to your attorney about your situation, those communications are totally confidential. Uh, there is no tattoo artist subject pr uh, privilege. Simply put, it does not exist. Hernandez will be back in court on June 16th um, to talk uh, on the Lloyd case and then on June 24th on the double slaying case. Two of his attorneys have apparently moved to withdraw based on non-payment. It's reported that he's seeking assistance to pay for his attorneys. It's going to be interesting to see if this player, who apparently received over $11 million from the NFL, will be deemed to qualify for the services of a public defender or other subsidiaries. Let's go on to talk about our top stories in the world of uh, criminal justice. Uh, first and foremost, let's talk about the Department of Justice report issued on Friday calling the L.A. County jails deplorable, stating that conditions have led to a dramatic increase in suicides, 15 in less than 30 months. That's up from four in 2012. The report describes the jails as dimly lit, vermin-infested, noisy, unsanitary, cramped, and crowded, and stated that its living conditions actually present a uh, present rather than prevent a risk of suicide. This became an international story over the weekend. It was BBC's cover story. It's not a new problem. For years, the ACLU has described the L.A. County jails as, 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 as just being there as a violation of cruel and unusual punishment. Um, it's been slated, the main uh, jail, Twin Towers, has been slated for dest uh, destruction. 18 Los Angeles County deputies were indicted in federal court in December in connection with the mistreatment of one inmate in particular and in, the, uh, in connection with the alleged deprivation of, of other inmates' civil rights. Uh, and this report follows the publication of, a, of, of an opinion piece by Los Angeles County uh, Superior Court Judge Terry Smirling talking about this proposed plan to spend $2.3 billion to build a bigger facility to house mentally ill as being pretty much completely ridiculous. He said, instead of spending large amounts uh, on a better jail experience for them, we should spend money on treatment programs that would keep low-risk offenders with mental illness out of jail. I, I do want to say for itself that this actually is progress. That, this monitoring by the Department of Justice, it stems from a 2002 action, but, but it's a step in the right direction. And the fact that they're actually evaluating these conditions is, 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 definitely, is definitely progress. But I'm interested in, in hearing your thoughts about why does this happen. Uh, incarceration of mentally ill people seems to do nothing to stop crimes in the long run. Uh, we have diversion programs. These are where people who are facing or convicted of, of uh, offenses who have mental illnesses can go get treatment, provided they complete their treatment, they avoid going to jail. And putting in the jail does nothing to help them or to protect, to protect society and to protect you and to protect us. It merely suspends the problem. It might even increase it because while people are incarcerated, they lose the connections and the support that they have on the outside. And now we, we know that the conditions of the L.A. County jails themselves uh, have been uh, such that it can actually increase instability. Um, so if you can help us understand why we want to spend money incarcerating these people rather than treating them, please let me know. Please send your thoughts to me at, uh, at mythoughts at renovatejustice.com, and hopefully we can address them. We're going to talk now about the uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision in Hall v. Florida, striking down Florida's reliance on an IQ test to determine if someone qualifies for execution. And for that, we're going to uh, speak with Pete Mills. Pete is an assistant public defender in Florida. He's director of his child uh, trial division. He's handled capital uh, cases for most of his career, and that's capital punishment as in death, death penalty. Uh, he's tried capital cases. He's argued them before the Supreme Court. Um, Mr. Mills, are you here? I am. Uh, Pete, thank you so much. Thank you for, for, for joining the show. Um, could, you give us, uh, could, could you give the listeners sort of a, a bullet point uh, understanding of what the Florida v. Hall case means? Florida v. Hall is limited to cases in which the defendant has made a claim that he or she is mentally retarded or, as it's now known, intellectually disabled. The U.S. Supreme Court in Atkins versus Virginia said that the Eighth Amendment prohibits the execution of people who are mentally retarded or intellectually disabled. What Hall did was bring Florida more into the norm with regard to IQ testing, and it said that Florida's rigid application of a strict cutoff of 70 on IQ testing was inappropriate since the people who create the IQ tests don't even believe that that should be done in that fashion. 
Okay. And then just, just so I understand it as well, um, this, this application of the rigid IQ test, um, c can you explain what that means? In essence, are we saying, okay, if someone has an IQ score of this, they can be executed? Is that, is that the gist of it? That is what the state of Florida was saying. To be found mentally retarded or intellectually disabled, a person has to have a significant sub-average general intel uh, intellectual functioning. That means that under our statute that they fall two standard deviations away from the norm. The norm or average IQ is 100. When you go down two standard deviations, it takes you to about 70. The people who created the IQ test said our test will provide you with a range because there is a standard error of measurement and we can't give you an exact IQ score. Uh, in addition to that, a person also has to have deficits in their adaptive behavior. Uh, can they make change? Can they hold a job? Can they take care of themselves? And then both of these things, the IQ as well as the deficits in adaptive behavior, have to have manifest themselves prior to the age of 18. Now, do, do you believe that these IQ tests um, uh, are, are inherently reliable, or do you, do, you, do you think they're way too subject to interpretation? Having worked with them, what, what's your take on, on their reliability, especially when we're talking about uh, you know, potentially executing someone? The tests themselves are generally accepted by uh, several professions. They're used by psychologists. They're used through schools uh, throughout the country. The problem with the tests can be in interpreting them and the way in which they are administered. Uh, if they're given to people who are inmates, uh, people who are trying to fudge their scores, people who uh, speak another language uh, as their primary language. Uh, if the person administering the test isn't a qualified professional, that's another problem. So there are a number of errors that can occur with the administration and interpretation of the test. The tests themselves are generally accepted. Do, do you think the, 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 the new practice, now that this, this just simple application has been struck down, is going to be uh, an, evalu an evaluation under the circumstances that an IQ test was taken, or is it going to be a more, a more broad evaluation of the individual who was convicted uh, of, of the crime? In other to, words, find, to, to find that? someone, to determine whether or not somebody's mentally retarded or intellectually disabled isn't simply an IQ test. It's okay. the test taking and then a review of their entire life, uh, looking at their adaptive, uh, whether they have uh, deficits in their adaptive behavior. Can they hold a job? How many jobs have they held? What kind of a job did the person hold, if any? Was it that they were a, this person was a truck driver or was it digging a ditch? There are uh, a wide range of jobs that a person can hold and a lot of different issues need to be evaluated when looking at the issue, not just the IQ. Uh, okay, and so what changes now that uh, are, can we expect to see now that this decision is, has come down? I take it they're individuals. It, it's, it's hard for me to say the words uh, qualify for executing, but is that the terminology that's, that, that's commonplace? Well, there is a people do have to qualify for the death penalty through the crimes that they've been charged with and or have been convicted of. But when talking about mental retardation, this is excluding or narrowing the range of people who would be uh, considered acceptable for execution. And the reason for that is in Atkins, the U.S. Supreme Court said that people, because of their disabilities in the areas of reasoning, judgment, control of their impulses, they don't act with the same level of moral culpability that characterizes most of the serious uh, adult criminal conduct that the death penalty is reserved for. And the impairments that these people suffer from uh, jeopardize the reliability and fairness of capital proceedings with people who are mentally retarded or intellectually disabled. Okay. All right, so what's, what are some of the changes that we're, we're going to see now? I take it there are individuals who did qualify uh, to be executed uh, in, in the past or are awaiting execution. Um, uh, do these people now, are they going to get an opportunity to have their, their cases revisited and see Absolutely. if they can be taken away from death row? Can there you talk will be a little bit about Yep. Sure, I'm sorry. There are absolutely going to be challenges because there were a series of cases, uh, defendants that went through the Florida court system, and because – Florida courts said, you do not meet our threshold requirement, uh, they were 
passed along and proceeded through the court system. Those cases, because the issues were hopefully preserved, should come back. What it means for people who are not in the system yet or are just entering in or are still at the trial stage, when their cases are evaluated with regard to what was a bright line or rigid rule of that 70 IQ, this will show that uh, there's not simply a bright line that below 70 means they qualify to be potentially found uh, mentally retarded or intellectually disabled and then look at the adaptive behavior deficits. It's going to be a range, and that range is going to be several points below and several points above. It's not just simply going to say you now have uh, an IQ of up to 75 in which you can be found mentally retarded. People who are found to be mentally retarded because they have an IQ below 70 might also now be found uh, not to be retarded. So it doesn't just cut toward the defendant's favor. Interesting. Interesting. Now, are these arguments going to be made? Is 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 like, for example, do you know if your office is going to open up a, a special, uh, you know, a wing or a special team to sort of revisit these cases? Or because I imagine this is also going to be expensive. I mean, a lot of these people get to, you know, should if their issues have been preserved, uh, have a chance to come back and say, hey, listen, you know, I don't qualify, and that's going to require a, a legal team. The death penalty is expensive, and most inmates who are in the state of Florida on death row have post-conviction lawyers, either through a uh, capital collateral representative who uh, is appointed by the state or a group of lawyers who signed up to join a registry. At the trial level in our office and in most public defenders' offices, there are special lawyers who uh, are on a team already. In the state of Florida, to handle capital cases, a person has to meet certain qualifications with regard to experience and training. And so I am confident that at the next training sessions that are held, those lawyers will all be getting information about Florida versus Hall and how to use it to defend their clients against the death penalty. All right. Well, that is very, very interesting. And, Mr. Mills, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thanks um, for having me. Uh, Oh, absolutely my pleasure. And if you're listening in, if you want to uh, read more from Mr. Mills, you can, he writes a column for The Defender. This is a magazine that was produced by the Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. And, Mr. Mills, that was exceptionally uh, informative. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Take care. So we are, we're going to switch over to talk about a uh, Department of Justice policy memo that was uh, apparently was um, uh, issued on May 12th. And it called for all federal agencies to electronically record interviews. Uh, we are going to be joining joining us in that discussion is going to be uh, Charles Curlett. Now, uh, Charles Curlett is a partner of the firm Levine and Curlett. He has a state and federal criminal practice in Maryland and D.C. Uh, Mr. Curlett worked at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, in 2004, he joined the, Chassidy, uh, the <clears throat> Atrocities Documentation Team. Now, this was a genocide investigation that was undertaken by the U.S. Department of State. Uh, that was in Eastern Chad. He, uh, Mr. Curlett is a former Manhattan Assistant District Attorney. He's a chair on several committees. And uh, Chad, are you here? I'm here. Good afternoon. Hey, well, good afternoon. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being Thanks. here. So could you talk to us uh, briefly about – or not briefly, just talk to us about this, this, this policy memo, exactly what is it and what does it change? Well, this, uh, this policy memorandum, which was issued by uh, Deputy Attorney General James Cole with the Department of Justice on May 12th uh, of this year, uh, represents what is really a sea change in Department of Justice policy when it comes to taking statements from uh, potential criminal defendants. Um, now, there are, there are really two ways to look at this new policy. One is, uh, why is it exciting? Why is it good? Uh, and then the second is, is it really as good as it seems? Because uh, as with so many things, the devil is in the details. Uh, but let me discuss for a moment what it does. Um, and, and in order to, to, fully un to fully appreciate it, you have to look at the past practice of the Department of Justice in taking witness statements. So traditionally, when, uh, say, the FBI uh, is taking a statement from a suspect, um, they'll do it in, in, an, in a team, and one agent will be asking the questions, and the other agent will be transcribing the questions and the answers uh, in his notes. The agent's notes are then typed up in a form, which is called a Form 302, 
uh, and that is the memorialization of the defendant's statements. And those will be provided in due course, usually late in the discovery process, but will be provided <laughs> to the defendant's lawyer uh, who's, heading to, who's heading to trial in discovery. The problems that that has created over time is that um, it is a uh, the, the statement itself is one step removed from what the defendant may have actually said, and it relies upon the interpretation of what was said of the agent. And when the agent is called to testify at trial, uh, he may or may not give a faithful report of what was said during that meeting. Could and you just give me sort of a, a, like a brief, like a layman's, you know, a, hi, I'm not a trial attorney, how does this work? Explain to a non-trial attorney uh, how an alleged statement like this previously could get in front of a jury. Like it go from, a, a, an alleged statement could come out of somebody's mouth, and then, and then can you summarize really quickly the steps that would eventually put th those ideas in, in front of a jury? Well, the rules of evidence permit uh, certain, def certain statements uh, of a defendant to be admitted in evidence if certain conditions are met. And the easiest way, the easiest example would be if it's a confession. Uh, now, if that statement is the product of a custodial interrogation, then... And by that you mean just in, in layman's terms? There are two, custodial right, there are, two, there are two pieces. You have to be in custody uh, in order for the Miranda... I mean, everyone understands the Miranda warnings. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right, uh, anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney. So in order for... Yeah, the, I think people have a, have a far too broad uh, version of Miranda warnings. I get so many clients who are arrested in cases where, as I'm sure you have, where, where statements aren't an issue, and they think because their rights weren't read to them, uh, they're going to qualify for, for a dismissal. Uh, whereas it's it's not the succinct definition that you just gave, right? Well, no, that that's exactly right. If um, if you're not in custody, you don't have to be given a Miranda warning. If you're in custody and you're just voluntary volunteering statements, uh, I've had clients in the back of a police car on their way downtown. No one's asking them. They're in custody, but no one's asking them questions, uh, and they're just volunteering all kinds of information. And the police officers are dutifully taking notes. Uh, in the front seat. All those statements are admissible against the defendant. Uh, but in the federal context, when you have FBI agents taking these statements, uh, they'll seek to admit the statement, and if it was a, the product of a custodial interrogation, so they're in custody, they've been given their Miranda warnings, and they're answering questions of the agents, these statements are admissible. But everyone remembers the game that you play as, as, as children uh, of, of telephone, where you sit in a circle and somebody whispers in the ear of the person to their left a statement, and then they whisper it to the ear of the person on their left. And by the time it goes around the circle, the last person says out loud what it was, where, where it started, and the, the joke of the game is that everybody laughs at how different it is. Well, this is, the, this is, in essence, the problem posed by the system as it has always existed. It is, you know, it, it's one step in that game of telephone, and a defendant's statements um, need not to have changed dramatically between what they may have said and how they're reported. A subtle difference can mean the difference between guilt and innocence. And so that's what this sure. new policy is trying to remedy. And so the policy is... Uh, when a federal agent with any of the leading agencies, that's uh, DEA, ATF, uh, or the Marshal Service, or the FBI, the four, uh, when they're taking a statement, there is now a presumption that if the person is in custody uh, and the circumstances permit, there is a presumption that the statement will be recorded. And in instances where that happens, it's a very good thing because – no longer is the agent's credibility going to be subject to, to be you know, challenged. Um, the, the statement will be memorialized. It will be recorded. Yeah, well, well, quick question on that. So if, mm -hmm. if uh, an agent gets on the stand and says, you know, so-and-so you know, said this, and this is prior to the issuance of the memo, let's say it hasn't been recorded, and, and, and the defense counsel wants to get up and say, hey, listen, you know, my client never, never said that. There's really, there's really only, only two ways they can do it, right? They can attack... The, the way in which the, the alleged confession was recorded or the interest of the person who, who claimed to have recorded it, or, they could, or the, the defendant would have to give up his, his right against self-incrimination, right? He would have to get up and say, I didn't say that, and then let the, and let the jury decide. Well, that's right. Uh, if the statement was not recorded and the ATF agent testifies that the, statement, uh, that the, that the defendant made a particular statement, uh, the defendant is, is going to be the only one who can testify differently. And there you have, you're in the unenviable position of putting your client's credibility 
uh, against the credibility of the law enforcement officer, and that you know the deck is stacked against your client in those circumstances, because as soon as they have to take the stand, um, they open themselves up to cross examination on a host of other topics as well, um, and that is frequently not in the best interest of the defendant to sure. do a trial. Um, so, the so uh, fundamentally, this is a good thing because at bottom. A defendant's statement in the interview process will not be subject to misrepresentation. Now, if the statement, right. if the, if the statement is an admission, then you know, it can still be evidence against the defendant. But it, it, it appears it could even be a, 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 I mean, a boondoggle for prosecutors because I imagine if it's easier to, you know, to, get a, to get an electronic recording or even better, a video recording, that's going to have infinitely greater impact than a law enforcement officer's reiteration, right? I mean, if, if a jury, I, it's it's certainly going to be more powerful evidence. I think that's correct. Right. I think that's correct. So the question, so in the face of this good news, uh, the the next question is what criticisms are arising, um, and is is this really as good as it sounds? Um, and in my view, this is a step in the right direction. It could be stronger, but you know, compared to where we were, it's much better. For example, first, the policy merely establishes a presumption. It's not a rule. It's not a requirement. Uh, right. It's just a presumption. So if, if all the circumstances permit, this is something you're supposed to do. Um, and it will be left to the internal Department of Justice guidelines to see what happens if you don't or why you didn't and how those policies will develop. But the language there is softer than saying there is a requirement. Um, secondly, the memo seems to have a, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. It seems to have a lot of um, uh, of what it is not as well. It, 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 well, it, it enumerates very clearly in the memo. First, it says, all right, we're going to have this presumption. We're going to record these statements, and here's where it's you know here's how it's going to take place. And then the whole second section of the memo is exceptions to the presumption. Um, so there are there are significant carve outs. For example, and we touched on this already, it only applies to people that are already in custody. Well. The vast majority of statements that are taken by federal agents uh, involve people that are not in custody. So when the FBI is in the field and they step, they're on. You, know, you picture the old uh, X Files where uh, Scully and Mulder are knocking on someone's door. That statement <laughs> they're is not def definitely be. not a custodial situation. <laughs> exactly, and now those statements are not going to be recorded. And so much of the work of federal agents is is done that way in the field. Um, so there is a whole category of interviews uh, that are not necessarily going to be recorded. Um, the uh, you know, the, now, the, Chad, the memo. We only got about a minute. Mm -hmm. We only got about a, about a minute left. Uh, it seems sure. to me also you you talked about uh, other ways that 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 this memo uh, talks about what it does not apply to. It, it, it appears like it doesn't apply. It only part applies to structures. Is that correct? Doesn't apply. Does, it doesn't appear to apply to like you know, if an agent asks somebody in a car, you know, or being transported anywhere, it doesn't appear like it, it's going. To, it would apply to that. Uh, do you think that's well, going to yeah, make a big it, difference? Well, it, sure. It, it, again, it's a limiting feature because it's, it requires that there has to be what they refer to as suitable recording equipment. Um, and it sounds like the definition of suitable recording equipment in the memo is going to be something perhaps unnecessarily formalistic and complex that you've got to have some sort of recording system in a in a precinct house, okay. for example. Um, but well, the, last the fact of the matter is an iPhone, oh, sorry, yes. an iPhone will do the, an iPhone should, yeah, an that's iPhone that's will a, do the job. Yeah, almost everybody has this with a, you know, with a, within a, a quick arm's reach. Um, so let's say somebody calls you, you have 15 minutes. Here's your, here's your money question for the day, 15 seconds. Someone calls you and said, hey, I've been accused of a crime. These agents are here. I'm just going to go ahead and talk to them. Is that okay? What's your response? That is never okay. Give them <laughs> okay. my name and phone number, ask them to call me, and we'll set up a meeting. Perfect. Message. Perfect. Well, thanks, Chad. Thanks so much for joining. And if you are listening, if you want to learn more about Chad, you can uh, go to his website, at levincurlet.com. Uh, and Marilyn, Chad, thank you so much for being here. Thanks a bunch. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So that's going to wrap up uh, this week's edition of uh, actually the pilot episode of, of Wallach on Law. I want to thank, uh, give a special thanks to our guests Pete Mills and Chad Curlett. You can follow what we do at renovatejustice.com, or you can send me your thoughts at my thoughts at renovatejustice.com, and my blog at trialfiend.com, and me at wallachlegal.com, wallachlegal.com. Big props and special thanks to our producers, Mark Goldman and Ryan McCormick in New York, and to our contributors, Eliza Spadaburk and Cindy Shupak. Thank you all for your time today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for caring. And remember, let's keep using our heads and stop using our hate. Thanks a bunch. <laughs>